Uh, good evening, our audience. Good evening, friends. Uh, before we start, I would like to welcome my teacher and prof, Andrew Dimchok. Hi there, Dimchok. And uh, I'm, I'm more than happy and honored to welcome all the participants and the guests tonight for the 11th chapter of Minaso Education Academy, Cerebrovascular Disease Grand Round 2022. This journey with these series of webinar has been completed its second year. And it's great that monthly we're able to get a distinguished speaker from the region, from Middle East and globally. The Cerebrovascular Grand Round webinar is a unique platform that provides comprehensive education about cerebrovascular disease and the stroke field and its latest treatment and management. The focus for today's webinar is on recurrent ischemic stroke and challenge in stroke care and treatment outcomes. Tonight, our participant, if you have any Q&A, please use the box in the Zoom for Q&A questions, and we will be more than happy both of the chairmen for tonight, Dr. Hani Araf and me to ask both the speaker about your questions at the end of this webinar. Tonight, we will have two distinguished speakers. The first one is from Calgary, Canada, Prof. Professor Andrew Dimchok. Professor Dimchok is a professor of neurology at Department of Clinical Neuroscience at University of Calgary. He is also a stroke neurologist and the director of Calgary Stroke Program, Alberta Health Services. Professor Dimchok has a numerous publication and guidelines in the field of stroke and cerebrovascular disease. He is a primary research interest focused on vascular imaging where he is trying to establish target populations for new stroke treatment by selecting patients based on imaging tests performed in the emergency setting. Our second speaker is friends of mine, Dr. Firas Khalifa Al Nidawi from Bahrain. Dr. Firas did his bachelor from Baghdad Medical School and fellowship in Iraq keyboard for neurology and European board in neurology. Currently, Dr. Firas specializes in stroke and he's running the stroke unit at Salmania Medical Complex in Bahrain. At the same time, he's interested in migraine and headache. With no further delay, I would like to welcome Professor Hani Araf. Hani Araf is a senior neurologist, vice president of MENA Stroke Organization and the head of neurology department at Ain Shams University. Dr. Hani Araf has a numerous efforts in building a stroke at level of Egypt, southern part of Egypt, Africa, and the Middle East. At the same time, he's editor member of the editorial board of European Journal of Neurology and member of the scientific committee of MENA Ektrem and general secretary for MENA, so Middle East North Africa Stroke Organization. Dr. Hani, welcome, sir. Man Max, Hani, unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor Sohail. It's a great pleasure to uh, be with you all in this session. Okay. Hi, Professor Andrew and Dr. Firas. You can both unmute yourself. Hi there, what? Andrew. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hope you are doing great. Did it start snowing there in Calgary? Sadly, it did. We had over a foot of snow already. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so everything is white. So you're going to have a white Christmas this year. Very, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was driving just now, it's almost 8 p.m. in Dubai. The temperature outside is 31. Serious. <laughs> uh, marhaba, Dr. Firas. Welcome, Firas. Marhaba, Dr. Ahmed. 
اهلا وسهلا اهلا Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, as you are seeing here, Dr. Demchok, we have a good number of attendees from Middle East and uh, our attendees usually coming for more than 47 country in Middle East, Africa and uh, Asia. So the number will go up and hope people will uh, enjoy tonight webinar. All our webinars for the audience is recorded and it will be on the Minaso YouTube channel where they can go back to this webinar and listen to our speakers. Second thing, before we start, I would like to thank Medtronic and Boehringer's Ingelheim for their support of these type of monthly webinars. Tonight, our first speaker is Professor Dimchok, who will update us about challenge in stroke care and treatment outcome. Professor Andrew, you can start sharing your slide. Thank you. All right, does everyone see it? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful. Okay, well, wow, what a terrific turnout, Sahal. I think that's amazing, over 400 people. That's one of the best Zoom turnouts I can recall and uh, tremendous effort from all of you at Manasso and, and, and uh, really working with many countries around the world. Um, to try to improve stroke care. So I, I have a very interesting topic. I'm quite uh, quite enjoyed actually preparing this. I did something somewhat similar recently, but updated it. And we're going to talk about the challenges in stroke care and treatment outcomes. I'm going to hopefully offer you some solutions to how to advance care in your countries, because uh, it's such a great challenge for all of us. I will receive an honorarium for this lecture from Borg and Gelheim, which is a licensure for TPA and Tenecta Plays. I'm going to start by uh, quickly uh, um, updating you on our, our, I think, our evolving challenge uh, with the COVID pandemic. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the COVID pandemic. I think this has been talked up uh, far too much already, uh, but uh, I think it's important to just cover a few things. So clearly, uh, with the pandemic, we, we faced an initial drop in stroke incidence, uh, and now I believe we face an increase in stroke incidence. And this drop occurred very quickly in, in the uh, early days of 2020. This is data from uh, rapid imaging software uh, showing a drop off in the number of, of, of stroke imaging processing that occurred. <clears throat> this uh, was uh, correlated very well with reductions in emergency room visits, uh, really for all sorts of conditions uh, uh, that lasted for several months. Uh, there are many explanations for this. Fear of uh, getting COVID by coming to the emergency room was the one that was often touted as the most substantial. But I actually think the most likely explanation for this was actually our social distancing. We actually had a significant fall off in uh, infections overall. And as we've learned over many years, infection is a, a trigger often for stroke. And I think we are actually preventing strokes through uh, the need to social distance at, at, the, at the worst stage of the pandemic. Um, you can see that flu season was cut very abruptly short by social distancing. So some of the big triggers for many of the chronic illnesses, including uh, really stroke, uh, were affected by this. But this has since, since rebounded very quickly, and we're now approaching uh, rates of stroke that likely slightly exceed what we're used to. And we can see that with some of the data that the, the baseline level of stroke is, is being slightly exceeded now as we return to a, a, a new normal uh, of, uh, of regular activities and economic activities. Now, one of the reasons that it may be slightly above the normal baseline is that uh, COVID is essentially in part of vascular disease. It's really attacking the endothelium of blood vessels. The endotheliopathy or endotheliitis triggers all sorts of uh, thrombotic activities. We know D-dimer levels uh, go up in some patients and really sets up a milieu of trouble, uh, both at the endothelial level with stasis due to immobility and uh, with hypercoagulability. In fact, there's uh, very interesting data that for patients with severe COVID, we're seeing all sorts of brain lesions both ischemic and hemorrhagic, microinfarcts, microhemorrhages, uh, a variety of things. And there are many explanations for this, including hypoxia, 
um, changes with uh, right left uh, pressures, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, can contribute to this problem. But it's uh, the brain fog that is seen with severe COVID likely has a manifestation that's at least part vascular. Uh, if you look at the types of strokes that have been occurring with COVID, they are just a bit worse. Uh, outcomes are a bit worse, mortality is higher, and there's a higher incidence of LVO. In fact, there's this phenomenon of two LVOs simultaneously that we're seeing with COVID positive patients that we really rarely saw before, where not only is one vessel, major vessel occluded, maybe two distinct large vessel occlusions at once. Uh, unfortunately, of course, this has resulted in worse outcomes. Uh, and of course, some of the, the challenges that we had around protecting patients and the healthcare workers from COVID led to delays to treatment in many ways that negatively impacted these patients over time. This has likely resulted in what we're seeing is an increased uh, mortality rate related to stroke and COVID. Uh, so COVID uh, and the COVID period, stroke mortality went up. Again, probably because of delayed presentation, more severe strokes, et cetera. Um, so we, we have a, a, a more severe entity we're facing. Some very interesting phenomenon have been reported. Uh, I, I've seen a number of patients with carotid thrombi in young populations uh, where a patient with a normal carotid artery suddenly has a big carotid thrombus and is in large trouble from stroke uh, as a result of a COVID, active COVID infection. Similarly, there have been reports of a local arteriopathy, coagulopathy, and this is not surprising because the endothelium is inflamed from COVID. Uh, and as a result, uh, you get strange uh, uh, arteriopathy. Some of them actually persist. Uh, this has been reported particularly in the virtual basilar system in some patients. Now, what does this overall mean for the incidence of stroke? I think a slight blip uh, at the worst of the Omicron wave, where we saw literally hundreds of thousand patients in the Calgary area infected at once with COVID, we saw a bit of a blip, I would say about 30 additional stroke patients in our hospital over about a three-month period. So, you know, a five, maybe 10% rise overall. And that's what's epidemiologically is being seen. A few extra strokes per thousand infections uh, is, is predicted. Uh, and uh, this is both with several vascular disorders, as well as obviously with cardiac and other disorders too. So we're going to just see a little bit of a rise above baseline that's going to strain our healthcare systems. Just a brief uh, speak to immunization and stroke. I'm not sure if the adenovirus vaccinations are still being used in some countries uh, that are uh, participating in this webinar, uh, but uh, there's clearly a relationship with the adenovirus vaccines a relationship with uh, antibodies to v, uh, PF4 and the development of a HIT-like syndrome in these patients, uh, which can be detected uh, between four and 20 days post-vaccination by doing a CBC, identifying a low platelet count, and then ordering a D-dimer and subsequent workup for, for venous thrombosis, both cerebral and peripheral. And this can be managed with no heparin, no platelet transfusions, uh, direct oral anticoagulants, uh, and IVIG therapy. Uh, I'm not sure this is being reported much anymore. I haven't seen much at all uh, on this in the last little while. So I presume there's been a shift away from the adenovirus vaccinations at this stage of the pandemic for the boosters. In terms of stroke risk from vaccination, very marginal, if any effect. There's just a slight hint of an increase. Uh, I've certainly seen uh, maybe uh, anecdotally, but uh, and maybe just by accident, I've seen a few patients suffer stroke within a day or two of vaccination. So there probably is some very small relationship, but it's, it's very small and may relate to, again, the uh, pro-inflammatory state that's created by vaccination in general. So where are we going now uh, with this pandemic? We are now in the post-peak wave phase of the pandemic. What does that mean? Well, the Omicron wave was the peak. That occurred early on, late 2021, uh, early 2022. It was a huge uh, 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 infection rate, and uh, we'll probably never come close to that uh, amount of infection at once. So we are now in the post-peak uh, phase, but probably not quite in the endemic phase yet, as we still have uh, uh, local flare-ups and outbreaks. We're not at a stage where there's a baseline level of activity and then seasonal uh, elevations typical of coronavirus infection. So we're getting there, but we're not there quite yet. We're in this 
pandemic shifting to endemic phase overall. Our growth is still not entirely stable. We have the blips, uh, but we will, I think, eventually evolve to a seasonal uh, COVID uh, problem uh, in, in subsequent years. The really good news is that per uh, infection estimation, the mortality rate now is really getting quite remarkably low. This is more of a, a, a illness with morbidity than it is an illness with mortality anymore, which is uh, at least, I think, uh, is somewhat reassuring for all of us. But it has created a problem, and the problem is really coming on right now. And that is that we've had a waning immunity. We have a, a so-called immunity gap for other re respiratory illnesses because of the COVID-19 control period where we were socially distancing, protecting ourselves. There's now a massive wave of pediatric uh, upper respiratory tract infections from RSV and flu that uh, were uh, essentially a rebound effect. And it's happening to us uh, as we speak. We saw a complete fall off in RSV and flu infections for the last two and a half years uh, replaced by COVID infections. Well, they're all coming back now that we're returning to normal and we're now in the so-called triple-demic uh, winter uh, of flu, RSV and COVID. And in Alberta, we're seeing exponential growth in all of uh, these viruses as we speak uh, with the latest wastewater data. So what does this all mean for stroke? I suspect it will add to the blip because we're seeing uh, significant uh, relationships between upper respiratory tract infection and stroke events. Lots of literature on this uh, and uh, it can be up to tenfold increases in the chance of stroke uh, at the time of an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, one thing we can do, and I would encourage each country to uh, encourage this, especially in their older patients, is get the flu vaccine. This is data that my colleague Michael Hill just published in Lancet Public Health, where he showed uh, in his group that uh, by getting the flu vaccine, you reduce your probability of stroke uh, significantly. Um, uh, subsequently, especially if you're over the age of about 70. Uh, and this is ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and, and subarachnoid hemorrhage events were significantly curtailed if you were vaccinated. Really interesting epidemiological data supporting uh, getting the flu vaccine. And I think if there ever was a winter that we needed to do this, it would be this winter, because I suspect our immunity to the flu is, is quite compromised. So we've got a, a condition that I'm sure has frustrated all of you. Healthcare dollars are, are heavily diverted toward COVID waves. We now have the triple-demic, especially at pediatric hospitals, that will also draw healthcare dollars. Uh, we expect to see an overall increase in stroke cases due to uh, elevated COVID infection rates, long COVID impacts, all these upper respiratory tract viruses that will now have free reign uh, with uh, and, uh, reduced immunity. And then, of course, the issue of neglected primary care that some of our patients have had by being fear of going to the doctors uh, for uh, management of their hypertension and other diseases over the last couple of years due to concerns of getting COVID at a clinic. Uh, so those are going to be things we face. We're just going to have to live with them. Uh, I do think now, though, it is time to refocus our energies on our other stroke challenges. So let's talk about some of these non-COVID related challenges. Um, I'm going to really speak about solutions here rather than challenges there. You know, I have an old adage, if someone has a concern, come with a solution to the problem and I'll listen to you. Uh, just complaining about things isn't really an effective strategy. So we need solutions. So I'm going to really approach this uh, with the focus on solutions. Those of you that aren't familiar with this need to read this. This is the roadmap to quality stroke care that was uh, developed by the World Stroke Organization. That's the link. Terrific roadmap for anybody who's on this call, who's developing stroke care, improving the quality of stroke care. Terrifically laid out information. Patty Lindsay, who's a friend and colleague in Canada, was a lead uh, uh, author for developing this through the World Stroke. Uh, you really need to get ahead of stroke by improving stroke systems. And our, our current problem is a lack of highly trained personnel. Uh, it is so terrific to see 400 or more people on this call. It means to me, you're all stroke champions. By coming here, by regularly attending these webinars, you become the key highly trained personnel. And now you need to multiply yourselves. 
because this is uh we just do not have enough people one of the main elements of essential and advanced stroke care is access to physician and nursing expertise in stroke that's it's lacking all over the place especially in the developing world we need to work on it we also have huge issues with training of emergency medical services and getting ambulances to to appropriately transport patients quickly to hospital now what's adding to this challenge is we have burnout we have a significant number of healthcare workers who have quit the profession this is in the us the pandemic the overburden um the um some, all sorts of things really uh, have influenced healthcare workers to literally quit their jobs and move to another field. So we're going to have the added challenge of fewer healthcare workers to choose from. So we need to do a really good job being super enthusiastic about stroke. That's I spend most of my time being enthusiastic about stroke because that's how I will retain my personnel and actually build uh, stroke care in a region. One of the things uh, that we, we've done, uh, I, I chair the Canadian Stroke Consortium, and I would encourage any of you on this call to uh, consider being an associate member. It's a free service uh, to be an associate member of the CSC. And if you're actually really keen as a physician who've had some training, uh, advanced training in stroke, uh, there is also an international PAM category for our organization. Uh, we really want to encourage uh, th those physicians who've spent time in Canada uh, to to remain linked to our group, but this is a consortium is a, our a, a professional association of stroke physicians across Canada, and I think we need to develop these professional associations uh, everywhere to work together. We do a ton of educational events amongst us, including monthly webinars, much like what's going on here, and that's really to educate our group. We also train residents. We have a very serious resident review course. Uh, Sahal participated in that a few many years ago. Uh, and uh, those are lasting experiences. Those would track neurology residents to stroke, which is very, very critical in many countries. We now have a CSC National Stroke Fellowship Certification Program. So when a Canadian, when a, a fellow comes and trains in Canada, they can be certified formally as a fellow and get an FCSC at the end of their training. Uh, and there are three different categories, certificate, expert, and scholar for the amount of training they do. This includes an exam and uh, uh, EPAs uh, evaluating their skills over the course of the year. Um, so that you need these programs to be able to really advance things. So please establish those, make partnerships with other countries, but do that. Prioritizing thrombectomy facilities and personnel is also essential. We're up to 27 comprehensive stroke centers in Canada for 40 million people. These are our thrombectomy capable hospitals and they're located in our larger geographic areas. We desperately need these in place in every country around the world that serves a population of at least 500,000 or more. That's about the right number to have a sufficient volume to develop the expertise. Now going along with that, of course, are other elements capability of neurosurgery, neuro ICU, et cetera, that can go with the thrombectomy. And this is laid out in the advanced stroke services of the WSO blueprint that I would urge you all to look at. Now, one of the challenges is how much training is needed to do thrombectomy? Well, the recommendations generally are at least one dedicated year of training and an annual volume of about 15 cases per year minimum per, per individual interventionalist. Those are manageable recommendations and they're highly recommended and supported by all the major endovascular uh, societies around the world. There are also solutions that can be local to this problem. There are telehealth approaches, linkages to experts in larger facilities that can be developed. Uh, the MT2020 is, is thinking about some of these approaches, uh, preceptorships, etc., to be able to bring the intervention to more physicians uh, through these uh, uh, unique solutions like telemedicine. Stroke center certification, but not too many, is also really essential. We need to establish uh, stroke center models in every country around the world. We need the comprehensive stroke center, which has the thrombectomy, neurosurgery, neuro-ICU support. We need the primary stroke center that can provide thrombolytic treatment, and in most cases have a stroke unit. Uh, and then we may need an, an, a, a sort of minimal approach uh, hospital 
which doesn't have the ability to uh, uh, resource a stroke unit, but has the capability with a CT scanner to give intravenous thrombolysis, for example. And these are laid out uh, uh, as you know some of the different parameters required uh, to be a comp. This is the U.S. version of this, uh, where where you lay out the differences in resources between a comprehensive stroke center and a primary stroke center. Uh, there is good news uh, being developed. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the World Stroke Organization has teamed up, for example, in Latin America. The same thing could be considered in the Middle East and, uh, and North Africa, uh, and that is a stroke certification has been developed. It's a free service um, uh, a where hospitals are evaluated and undergo certification as a stroke center. I'm not, I'm not personally involved in this, but I think it's a terrific in, uh, initiative and badly needed around the world. So I would encourage you to reach out to the WSO and see if there's any plans uh, to do this in other parts of the world. Perhaps this is a good initiative for Manasso to consider in the future, uh, depending how things go for Latin America, who's currently uh, uh, in transition with this. Now, if we think about the Middle East uh, and North Africa, we really have to understand our population densities in establishing these stroke centers. And I just uh, randomly put uh, red dots for comprehensive and, um, uh, and uh, yellow dots for uh, primary, but clearly uh, we need a lot of primaries and comprehensives uh, uh, put in place all over the place. I think in many cases that exists, but we need to do a lot more of this, right? We need to work with with countries. There's many red dots here that aren't represented. So apologies for anybody on the call that doesn't see a red dot where they are. Uh, this is just sort of a, a, an example representation of what could be done. We need to put these in place and as soon as possible. In Alberta, we have two comprehensive stroke centers and 16 primary stroke centers. The primary stroke centers are geographically located away from the primary stroke centers where we have CT scan uh, CT scanners in place, but it covers most of the geography of the province. This is southern Alberta. We have purposely only put one comprehensive stroke center within a 130 kilometer radius of the Foothills Hospital where I work, and that is so that all the stroke patients come into one facility. This is not possible in some jurisdictions, uh, but in especially in socialized health models, these uh, the, this sort of approach can certainly be established. If you look at uh, the challenges with this, um, this is an example of LA County. Uh, a few years back, there was an area of need identified for a primary stroke center. This was filled. And now there's actually nine stroke centers in about a 15 mile radius in LA County. That's a lot of stroke centers. And of course, adds many challenges around where do you transport a patient? Not all those nine necessarily have thrombectomy facilities. So we have to think speedy workflow and collect metrics. This is really important. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this paper, but this one will help you lobby for resources. For every one minute delay to reperfusing the brain with thrombectomy, the lifetime cost is $1,000 per minute. So a two hour delay in a single patient will result and 120,000 US dollars in costs long-term. That's huge. We really need to digest this information and make a case for establishing these technologies to do reperfusion quite fast, because look at them, the overall downstream cost saved. So that's why we only have the one comprehensive stroke center in the Calgary metro area. We transport everyone into this facility if you are in a metro area where you have two or three primary stroke centers near a comprehensive, you should follow the 30 minute rule at a minimum. So if the transport of a large vessel occlusion type patient, so LAMS4 patient or other field test, is only 30 more minutes transport time than to the nearest primary stroke center, you should transport bypass to the comprehensive stroke center. This is the American guidelines this should be a minimum requirement. So if you've got close by primary stroke centers, they should be bypassed for hemiplegic strokes. And if you're not doing that, you need to encourage your, um, your, your system to change. The other thing that's happened uh, just recently, the Mr. Clean Late data has been presented at the World Stroke Organization just a couple of weeks ago, showing a statistically significant benefit in a late time window with simple imaging. So we now have an extended time window essentially to 24 hours. 
So this concept of bypassing LVOs probably, dare I say, requires a 24-hour window. We should screen all patients out to 24 hours if we have the capability of thrombectomy uh, because the benefit is seen with simple pragmatic imaging, which is just collateral uh, collaterals on a CTA and a plain CT of the brain. Uh, tremendous data uh, just recently presented the Mr. Clean late trial. Now, when we're establishing these things, we do run into the issues of capitalism and fiefdoms where and everybody wants a stroke center. And then you get into a situation where you've got more than you need and uh, your patients are sometimes being transported to facilities that don't have the capability to reperfuse. And so you have to work carefully through this. It's a challenging issue, uh, but you're, you're really standing on the high ground if your focus is to reperfuse fast. Now, at a comprehensive stroke center, you need to follow the 30, 60, 90 rule, 30 minute door to needle, 60 minute door to groin puncture, 90 minute door to reperfusion. Because if you can open the artery within three hours of onset, your chances of an excellent outcome with a large vessel occlusion exceeds 50%. That's a remarkable bit of data. And that's what we've seen in practice. We, we Having the only one stroke center in our area, we get to treat patients at an hour and a half from onset quite regularly. And we see Lazarus effects on the table. Patients essentially reversing their strokes on the table from a huge deficit to no deficit. And it's all because you're reperfusing fast. I can't emphasize enough it's worth all of your energies as a stroke champion in this call to delay and remove all the unnecessary barriers to reperfusion. Here's an example in Wisconsin where they've established primary stroke centers in several regions in the state. But one of their challenges is they've got a number of primary stroke centers in orange and two comprehensives. So patients are going to, uh, in some cases, not be bypassed and go to their local primary stroke center first. We've avoided that in, 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 the, in the Calgary, uh, Southern Alberta, because we don't have a primary stroke center close to the comprehensives. They only go to a primary if they're close to the primary and away from the comprehensive. The primary needs CT-CTA capability, a crucial uh, test. CT perfusion would be nice, but uh, I think is a difficult goal to achieve for primary stroke center. You need to be able to perform an emergency CTA 24-7. And you need telestroke capability with the, with the comprehensive stroke center. TPA is a complicated decision making. This is a, a, another lecture I can give in future for you. I love to teach on thrombolysis, uh, but I go into great detail understanding the pros and the cons. Everything on the left here in blue is very favorable for IV TPA treatment. Everything on the red in on the right is not favorable. So you're sometimes faced with very difficult decisions. And that's really where telestroke helps uh, a primary stroke center immensely with less expertise. You get the expert, bring the expert in to help with that TPA decision-making. Endovascular treatment has a little bit of a simpler paradigm. There are less red deal breakers for EVT and many blue, uh, but, they, but uh, EVT itself is still needs to, uh, to consider the distance of transport, et cetera, in the decision-making process. And that expertise by telestroke is essential. The other goal is you need to shorten your door-to-needle time at a primary stroke center and aim for a door-in, door-out time of at least less than 60 minutes or lower overall. This is a very important metric. Uh, a lot of patients are wasting a lot of time before they're being transported from a primary stroke center to a comprehensive stroke center. The ACT trial, I think, has helped us with this. This is a Bijoy Menon's trial that we led in Calgary, published in Lancet, showing the uh, slight uh, uh, favorable uh, benefit of tenectopase over altoplase, although this was a, a non, uh, the non-inferior margin was met. So these are really equivalent therapies, but tenectoplase offers advantages of a bolus injection uh, and uh, we may be able to move patients out of the uh, primary stroke center and on to the uh, comprehensive stroke center faster uh, because they, uh, they don't have an infusion en route. So tenectoplase data here, I think, will make our lives a little bit easier. And the tenectoplase data look particularly good in the LVO primary stroke center population. Uh, so I think a very good therapy. Alberta, we switched over to tenectoplase at our rural hospitals on November 1st of this year. One other uh, concern I have is the, the, this concept of air transport. Air transport's great, 
but it does result in longer decision to door out times. There's a lot of logistical issues around air transport that does end up slowing the timing uh, that the patient takes to get to the conference of stroke center. And so in this publication, they only recommend air tra travel beyond a 30 kilometer radius from the conference of stroke center. So if a patient's way out, there's value in it. If it's less than 30 kilometers, it's more questionable. Stroke units are also, of course, important and very critical to out good outcomes. And this should be essential to all primary stroke centers when possible. One last challenge is the rural zone of patients where patients are not close to a primary or comprehensive stroke center. Should you transport to the primary or to the comprehensive? There are many regions, I just take Saudi Arabia as an example, far away from large population areas where there's likely to be no primary stroke center nearby. This is where a phone call directly to the stroke physician at a comprehensive stroke center allows for a very careful discussion and decision where to transport the patient. We call this the rural field consultation. We've been doing this for five years in Alberta, and it's really helped us on deciding where to transport patients. The phys stroke physician can ask the paramedic or EMS provider directly what um, symptoms the patient has, what the premorbid function is, what the distances are, et cetera, and makes a decision where to transport the patients. But please don't forget the continuum of care uh, we are not emphasizing enough our efforts in stroke rehabilitation. We don't have enough stroke rehab experts. We're, there's a, a, um, a um, important uh, conference we're actually running in January. Uh, I'll put the, uh, the link in the, uh, the chat box for everyone, but this is a conference where we want to reach out to primary stroke rehab providers around the world and educate them in stroke rehabilitation. And uh, so uh, please uh, encourage you all to consider this because there's a huge gap in the knowledge of our stroke rehab pro providers uh, around the world right now that we have to close. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm right pretty much on the, the 35 minute mark of the hour and uh, I'll pass it on to my other colleague and then I will stay on for, for further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Domstek, for uh, this comprehensive presentation. You took us uh, through a journey from COVID to the improvement of stroke service, which is very important. I guess this is um, a very challenging uh, uh, thing which we all need to uh, improve uh, to improve the stroke service in our region. So uh, please stay uh, with us till the end of the session. I guess there will be a lot of questions. And now, without further delay, I will shift uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Firas Khalifa. He's a dear friend uh, from Bahrain, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, the recurrent ischemic stroke. Uh, please, Dr. Firas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Hani. Thank you, Prof, for the nice presentation. Uh, it's actually uh, a lot of uh, important information in this presentation. Uh, I don't Dr. know if Firas? my screen is shared. Can you share uh, your screen, uh, Dr. Firas? Okay, I'll, I will try again. I don't yes. know if it's shared now. Yes, yes, yeah, it's okay. sure. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, actually uh, the topic, this one, the recurrent uh, ischemic stroke is uh, uh, a practical uh, topic or a practical issue that we face it daily in our practice as a neurologist and as a strokeologist. I will go first uh, through, I don't know if the screen changed. Yes, I will go first uh, through uh, two cases that uh, uh, we treated in the last two years, but both of them not COVID. Uh, we screen all our patients, stroke patients, uh, before we uh, start on treatment. Uh, or in the emergency, sorry. So this is a 62-year-old woman with a remarkable past medical history presented with right upper limb weakness, lasted for six hours, and uh, on arrival, her symptoms uh, and I score was zero, and blood pressure was 170 over 85. Uh, actually, we admitted the patient, her CT showing no, uh, uh, no ischemic uh, lesions, no ischemic strokes, and we admitted the patient for further evaluation which include the 24-hour Volter monitoring, which was normal, a transthoracic uh, uh, echo, which was also normal. And then we did uh, an MRI, which is shown in the screen. Uh, this is, sorry, this is the uh, first MRI. And as you see that, the diffusion weight restriction is distributed in the right and the left, 
and even in the uh, cerebellum. And here we proceed with uh, the transesophageal uh, echo, and it's also came on. The patient at this point, uh, we started here on aspirin, and the patient discharged home with no focal deficit. Two weeks later, the same patient returned back with right-sided weakness and incoherent speech, which lasted only for uh, one hour. And uh, actually, in, in our stroke program, we have, uh, we have MRI protocol and we have uh, CT protocol. So we proceed directly with the MR, uh, which shows that there is an infarction, a new infarction, which is a territorial infarction in the uh, inferior branch of the uh, left middle cerebral artery as uh, shown in this diffusion weight and ADC map and in the uh, MRA. The second case is a 35 years old woman who presented with right-sided weakness, the slurred speech lasted for 13 minutes. Uh, according to the previous history, she was treated outside of a hospital. Uh, there was previous uh, two to three episodes of weakness lasted 14 to 15 minutes during the last four months, for which she was started on aspirin. The past medical history was significant for chronic headache, seven years, and back pain and joint pain, two years, and decreased memory in the last one year. And there was a negative family history for any uh, genetic disorder or hereditary disorder. And we did for her MRI, and it shows that there is a restricted diffusion, a small stroke in the left uh, hemisphere. And also the, the flare uh, shows that there is a macrovascular, there is a macrovascular pathic changes. So the question will be uh, here, what to do in these situations? Will we switch to a new antiplatelet? Will we start on dual antiplatelet? Or will we re-evaluate the possible mechanism of our stroke? Or we switch to uh, one of the no apps or do apps? So outline of my talk will be the definition and the epidemiology, the the predicting uh, of a recurrence of stroke, approach to stroke recurrence, and out outcome of these two cases. The recurrence, recurrence stroke in the literature, we have different uh, definitions. And in many registries, some of the registries, they exclude all events that occur be uh, before 28 days or within the first 28 days. Other studies, uh, they exclude all the, uh, patient, all the events that occur within the first 21 days. While other studies include all the all the evidence all the events that occur uh, after 24 hours, but they divide the patients that patients with stroke in the same territory and patients with stroke in the other territory. But we should exclude that this uh, new weakness or a new insult is not attributed to edema or hemorrhagic transformation or other clinical condition or drug toxicity. The other definition is uh, what called in the literature antiplatelet resistance or antiplatelet failure or low response uh, to antiplatelets. And actually, in the literature, we have two main definitions. There's also different, dif different definitions, but these, these are the main two definitions, which is first the lab definition, sorry, the lab definition, which is the evidence of inhibition of platelet aggregation by antiplatelet agents. And the clinical, which is referred refer to failure of antiplatelet in preventing uh, a thyrothrombotic event. But actually, we should keep in mind these two, these three facts. First, antiplatelet generally, they reduce the relative risk of stroke and myocardial infarction uh, at 10 and by 20 percent generally, and aspirin in this 15 percent. Platelet activated by multiple pathways, and not all uh, antiplatelet working on all the uh, receptors that activate uh, the, uh, the platelet. In addition to that, stroke is a heterogeneous condition, so we don't have only one mechanism to develop stroke. So what are the possible uh, causes or, uh, of antiplatelet resistance? So resistance could be divided into two categories, that resistance in the setting of inadequate inhibition, and this is mainly due to reduced bioavailability of the medication, or some genetic polymorphism, as in the case of uh, clobidogrel. So reduced by availability may be just non-adherence of the patient to the medication, or there is a drug-drug interaction, while resistance, despite adequate inhibition, that there is an activation of, anti of the platelet in, 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 in from other pathway, like inflammation, infection, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some other uh, some drug uh, that can suppress medications. 
but we should keep in mind that the guidelines that did not uh, recommend platelet function testing. This is the uh, statement from the American cardiology guidelines and also from the American stroke association guidelines that routine function tested is not recommended for patients with ischemic stroke. And actually, even in our stroke unit in Bahrain, I, we don't have uh, this facility and I don't know whether uh, it's available in other MENA region or in, uh, in, in maybe in Canada. I don't know. So. The difference in the definition lead to difference in the rate of uh, rate of recurrence uh, reported in the literature. So it ranges from uh, seven to twenty at one year and sixteen to thirty-five at uh, five years. In the United States, out of eight hundred eight hundred thousand cases, around one eighty-five thousand are recurrent, and one third to one half of those recurrent cases already on aspirin. In China, in a study published in Frontier Neurology. The overall rate of recurrence in one year was 5.7, and in five years it was 22.5. In Norway, the, cum the cumulative recurrence was 5.4 at one year and 11 point, uh, and around 11 in uh, five years. In MENA region, actually, we don't have any study, study uh, any study investigating the rate or the recurrence. We have only one study published in uh, uh, the Egyptian Journal of Neurology, Psychiatry, and Neurosurgery. And it was a small group study uh, trying to find the uh, risk factor predicting the recurrence of uh, stroke. Do we have any score uh, that can help us to uh, estimate or predict that this stroke will be recurrent? We have the Eason stroke uh, scale, the ESRS score, which is a 10, uh, a 10 point score, uh, consists from age, hypertension, diabetes, MI other cardiovascular, peripheral arterial disease and the smoking, or any additional previous TIA or ischemic stroke. And the cutoff point of this score, if the score is a three uh, equal to three or above, the risk of recurrence of stroke will be 4%, more than 4%. And this score is studied in many, uh, in, many, in, in many registries and in many other, many studies, actually. Uh, one in, published in 2009, and it showed that the higher the score, the higher the chance that the recurrence is there and the, 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 the need for more intensified secondary prevention strategies. The cutoff point also by the same group, but published in Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry, uh, found that they, they found that the cutoff point of three uh, is the cut point uh, beyond which the, there will be a higher rate of recurrence of stroke. Also, studies prove that the, the, the higher the patient, uh, the, uh, the ESRS score, in Korea, they found that the, most of the physician, neurologists, trochologists, they prefer to prescribe uh, dual antiplatelets for those patients. From those risk factors mentioned in the score, uh, there is a meta-analysis published in, Cere in Cerebrovascular Disease Journal trying to figure out uh, which, which is the most important uh, uh, factor, clinical and radiological, and which type of stroke uh, will carry high rate of recurrence. So from these factors, the past medical history of stroke or TIA is the most important. And they found that small vessel stroke were associated with a lower risk of recurrence than large vessel stroke. And they found uh, also that uh, embolic stroke of undetermined source have a lower risk of recurrence than large artery strokes. They, they couldn't find any studies about CT finding and ultrasound carotid Doppler or intracranial Doppler to predicting the risk of recurrence of stroke. But MRI findings, if we, if we just memorize the multiple lesions, as in our first case, multiple stage lesions and multiple territorial lesions, all of them, in addition to isolated cortical lesion and core chronic infarction, all of these radiological uh, features are associated with higher percentage of recurrence of stroke. So how we can manage or how we can approach to those patients? Actually, uh, there are four steps in which we can evaluate, we can approach those patients with recurrent of stroke. The first and the most important is identifying the correct mechanism of stroke. Because as we mentioned, stroke is a heterogeneous. So the most important is re-evaluate the pathway or the mechanism underlying the stroke. Increasing the bioavailability uh, and, uh, of the medications and management of laboratory antiplatelet resistance, as, and as I mentioned, this, it's not available in our country. 
one, the fourth thing is changing the antithrombotic therapy. We'll come to first one, identifying the correct mechanism of stroke. We know that stroke, we have multiple uh, mechanism. And as I mentioned previously, it's a heterogeneous uh, disease. We have small vessel, we have large vessel, we have cardioembolic. So maybe the stroke, the recurrence of, we are hitting the wrong, uh, the wrong targets. We are giving antiplatelets for a patient with cardioembolic stroke. Identifying the correct, uh, 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 the correct mechanism also, we should keep in mind that a lot of studies, uh, including uh, the last studies about uh, the ESOS, uh, navigate and uh, respect uh, studies, we found that for uh, prolonged, uh, prolonged monitoring of Hello. Hello. fibrillation. Also, we should keep in mind, as I mentioned, there are other mechanisms like, uh, like maybe this stroke is drug induced. Maybe stroke is induced by inflammation or infection, or as uh, uh, as previously in the first presentation, maybe it's COVID associated. Also, stroke may be hereditary, as in Milas, Fabry disease, Cadassol, Carassol or the patient already have insufficient control of, of the risk factor. Most of our patients, they have multiple medications, elderly patients, they may forget or uh, take the, uh, the antihypertensive or diabetic medications uh, or and, uh, the control of other risk factor is poor. And this usually associated with, uh, uh, with uh, more resistance of, uh, of the, to the antiplatelet function. How we can, sorry, how we can approach those patients? How we can, uh, uh, is there any algorithm? Actually, this algorithm published in New England Journal, this was discussing the cryptogenic stroke. And I like it because it is stepwise. So it will lead us step by step how to investigate our patient to reach to the correct underlying mechanism. So we have the standard uh, evaluation and we are doing it usually like echo, uh, trans thoracic echo, but uh, here, uh, here because they, are talking about uh, ESOS or cryptogenic stroke, they consider TEE, but it's not in the first time. Monitoring, the usual monitoring, and the usual baseline investigations. So if we don't reach to the diagnosis, we can go to advanced evaluation, which may include prolonged uh, monitoring for the cardiac rhythm, may include vasculitis test, may include some coagulopathies, and if we don't reach the diagnosis, we may go for specialized evaluation, which may include genetic, may include CSF examination even, may include uh, the autoimmune conditions, and even uh, loop recording for the AF. The more simplified one is the one published in the, uh, in the last uh, American guidelines for the secondary prevention, which I advise you to just, the, the audience just to follow it to reach the uh, correct underlying mechanism of stroke. The second, uh, the second step in dealing with recurrent stroke is increasing the bioavailability. The most important is improving adherence. It shows in the literature that around 50% of patients fail to adhere to their medication and to play that medication in the first year. Also medication side effects. We should ask our patients in their first visit after discharge, about if they have any side effect, whether they are, uh, they are okay with their medications or they are, they are intolerating their medications. We are dealing with a bulk of patients who are elderly, so they, they may have some memory problems. So we should be sure that they are taking their medications. And also there is a, the polypill concept, and this is a studied in secure study in cardiology. And it, it's a, a pill that contains aspirin, Antiplatelet, sorry, antilipid and, uh, and, and I think antihypertensive, and it showed that it's increased uh, the adherence of the patient to medications. And I think there is a study now running, I don't know if it's finished or, or published yet, but I remember I hear it from Prof. Michael Bryner, uh, the previous uh, World Stroke Organization uh, head, that this, there is a study running, and I don't think, I don't know whether it's published or not about polypills in stroke. Changing the formulation, As the asp aspirin need an acid, acid media to feed for better absorption. And this is usually in the stomach. So giving the patient the enteric coated or slow release 
which will be absorbed in the small intestine, intestine where the pH is in neutral, will lead to less absorption and will lead to delay absorption and may lead to uh, inadequate action. Avoiding drug-to-drug -drug interaction, we should check the, the, the patient medication, whether he's taking non-steroidal like apoprofen, which they act in the same receptor of, uh, uh, of aspirin, or PPI, as we mentioned that aspirin need acidity, uh, acidic uh, media. So PPI uh, may reduce the acidity and may affect the absorption. And even the PPI, uh, they, they act in the same receptor of clopidogrel, some of them. And this, the discussion be, uh, of, about this is beyond the scope of this presentation. Management of antiplatelet resistance. Here, in, here they try to use the devices, the POCT devices, or even some labs like PT uh, laboratory, uh, laboratory findings, like, like bleeding time and others, to choose what, anti what to do if, you have, if we have recurrent stroke. Also, the finding here did not support this approach. And as I mentioned previously, the guideline is not recommended using it until now. What about the four steps, which is what we do usually in our practice, a patient coming to us with a stroke, recurrent stroke, we either uh, we uh, change the antiplatelet, we start anticoagulant, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, one of the anticoagulants. So what, what, what about this concept? Is it right? The guidelines support it or not? And I, for the ESOS, actually, I refer you to one of the uh, presentation, nice presentation by Prof. Hani in the website of uh, Minaso in the YouTube you can find his nice presentation about ESOS. And we found that in Navigate and RESPECT studies that there is the empiric anticoagulation was not associated with lower stroke recurrence rate in ESOS patients. And that's why uh, even in the last uh, updated guideline from European Stroke Organization, they didn't recommend uh, NOACs uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the ESOS uh, strokes. So what about switching to another antiplatelet? So we know that from studies that globidogrel is effective, but switching from uh, aspirin to, uh, to, sorry, to clopidogrel, is it practical? Is it supported by studies? Actually, there are, uh, there is, th there are two or three studies, I'm not sure. There are three papers about this topic, main, main three papers. I choose just this one, which is the last one, in, uh, which is a Korean study. Uh, they, this, this is a multi-center, and they took around uh, around 1,172 patients. They divided them into maintaining those patients coming with recurrent stroke. They divided them into maintaining stroke, maintaining aspirin, or switching aspirin to other non-aspirin antiplatelet, or adding another antiplatelet agent to aspirin. And the outcome was a composite of stroke, which is uh, including ischemic hemorrhagic, MI, and vascular death, and here the switching was effective and ending also. While stroke recurrence alone, the switching was not statistically, statistically not significant. That's why in the updated and last updated uh, guidelines of the uh, secondary prevention, the American Stroke uh, Association recommend that for patients already taking aspirin at the time of non-cardioembolic ischemic stroke or TIA, the effectiveness of increasing the dose of aspirin or changing to another antiplatelet medication is not well established. What about starting dual antiplatelet? And actually studies about dual antiplatelet divided into two types. Those using dual antiplatelet for long time and those uh, using antiplatelet for short period. So for, for, for long duration, uh, like in MATCH, uh, Charisma and SPS3 studies, all of them conclude that there is no significant reduction while there is increase in hemorrhage. And that's why we have a clear recommendation from the European Stroke Organization guideline, last guideline, that uh, they didn't recommend long duration use of antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet, and they recommend use single antiplatelet. What about the short, uh, the short time? We have the chance uh, study, Chinese study. We have the point study. We have Thales, and we have chance to, which they are studying the and all this study found it's effective in short, uh, in short term and uh, in, 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 uh, in point study when they, to, when they use dual antiplatelet for uh, 90 days, the risk of hemorrhage was high, while when they adjusted to short uh, 21 to uh, this one, uh, 
21 to 30 days, the, uh, the benefit outweigh the risk. And I advise you and I recommend to read this paper, which is a narrative, uh, a, a narrative review for the last guidelines. And the recommendation is clear that if we have a patient with minor to moderate acute non-cardioembolic stroke, dual antiplatelet for 21 to 30 days and should be initiated within the first 24 hours. Also in patients with uh, intracranial stenosis, aspirin 325 is more effective than warfarin in reducing the risk of recurrence of stroke. In patients with 70 to uh, 90 stenosis, intracranial stenosis, adding uh, clopidogrel uh, for 90 days is reasonable. And in patients with uh, uh, concomitant uh, uh, stenosis, also adding uh, intracranial stenosis uh, at the same territory, according to Thalas study results and the group analysis, that the addition of the Gagrilor for uh, 90 days is maybe reasonable also. Returning to our cases, just to uh, give a solution for these cases. So as we mentioned that this patient presented initially with this MRI, the first MRI, you see multiple small infarctions uh, in right and left and in the, uh, uh, in the cerebellum also. And the other was uh, a territorial infarction. Actually, we investigate the patient. All investigations were normal and TEE reported again and it was normal, and a transthoracic echo was done again, and it was normal. The only one thing abnormal was the dimer, and did we decide to go with a PET scan, which unfortunately shows a, an advanced uh, pancreatic, pancreatic cancer, and this is what we call Trosso syndrome, in which the pancreas can, the pancreatic cancer can be presented as first presentation with recurrent stroke. And unfortunately, this patient again get another stroke, and uh, also she get uh, she got uh, PE. And unfortunately, after three months from admission, she uh, passed. Regarding the second case, examination revealed a pyramidal signs, and uh, the uh, the history, the family history, as I mentioned previously, was negative. Examination revealed alopecia. The patient mentioned clearly that she she lost. Uh, hair and she's having hair thinning. We did the MRI for the cervical spine and for the uh, lumbar spine, and it showed multiple disc degenerative disorder. Genetic study revealed a mutation in the HDRA1 variant, and the both parents were carriers, and the patient diagnosed with carousel. Uh, for for your information, if you want to review these uh, cases. So I uh, refer you to, for the uh, oncology case, you can read it in case report in oncology. And for the carousel case, it's accepted in the neurologist journal and will be published in the coming issue. And uh, just take home message that the most important in recurrent of stroke, just re-evaluate the stroke mechanism. This is very important. Control the risk factor, check the adherence of the patient, try to check the med patient medication to avoid drug-to-drug -drug interaction. You may consider uh, antiplatelets, new antiplatelets in case of intracranial stenosis and short-term uh, dual antiplatelets supported by guideline in case of minor to moderate stroke. Finally, the whole purpose of education is a turn a mirror to window and I hope turn at least one of the mirror into window and thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Firas, uh, very much for this comprehensive presentation and for these uh, nice and interesting cases you presented, which uh, actually it's very important uh, to search uh, also for the reason of recurrent stroke uh, out of the box, uh, especially this uh, cancer patient. Uh, we will start to take questions. I can see also uh, Dr. Suhail with us. Uh, so I will just have... Um, one or two comments, and then I will leave uh, Dr. Suhail to start uh, taking the questions. The first comment, actually, it's in the Q&A. Do we have stroke centers in the Middle East? And if there is not, what is the future plan? Of course, we have a lot of stroke centers in the Middle East, and this is our mission. Of course, the Minaso mission is to start uh, or to help uh, our colleagues in different regions to build stroke units and stroke centers. Of course, we have uh, very good comprehensive stroke centers in many countries, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Kuwait, and many other countries. Uh, and the, many of these centers actually are certified either with the American certification or German certification. Uh, 
Uh, but of course, uh, we are lacking stroke units in many other areas and also in even these countries, we need more and more uh, stroke centers. Um, uh, the other thing regarding the comment you said about uh, the um, uh, causes of recurrent stroke in Egypt, you mentioned uh, one of the papers from Egypt, probably I guess I was involved in this publication, it's almost 40%. And uh, the reason, as you said, it's a lack of compliance and also a lack of uh, improving the different risk factors. Of course, people are not taking the drug, uh, as you said, uh, regularly, and also they are not taking care of the hypertension, uh, uh, diabetes, and uh, lifestyle, and so on. Now I will leave the uh, mic uh, for Dr. Suhail to start uh, taking the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Hani. What amazing uh, two presentation going from a challenge uh, situation during COVID, uh, challenge building uh, stroke service in uh, in in uh, in different uh, region and speaking about there's an echo there. Is it from my end? Okay, and then speak speak with Dr. Firas regarding uh, uh, two challenge cases and. Uh, uh, update in management of these patients. Uh, there's many questions. I will ask all the participants. We have a good number today uh, to put their Q&A box. So uh, uh, going back to what Dr. Hani uh, and uh, Prof. Andrew is with us uh, tonight also. So Andrew, when, when uh, I'm training in Canada, so when I came back, we did a small survey at that time in 2011, looking for how many stroke center are in Middle East and how many patients are TPA. Unfortunate, all the Ministry of Health, they didn't have any major clue in that time about stroke. So we asked Boringer Zingelheim to give us insight about the consumption of TPA for acute stroke. And we found that Ali Al Khathami came with a paper in 2011 that 50 patients has been thrombolized in 2011 in Kingdom Saudi Arabia with the population at that time almost more than 24 million okay which was a red flag uh, after 10 years of that journey uh, in a country like Saudi Arabia there's more than uh, 75 stroke center from a primary to comprehensive the TPA consumption or thrombolized patients went from 50 per a year to more than few thousands per a year. The same story in Egypt, Dr. Hani Arif is leading this. I remember when the first time I visited Egypt in 2013, uh, TPA was not reimbursed by the government, is not available in the governmental hospital, neither in the private hospital. Currently, Dr. Hani is uh, having more than 100 stroke units through Egypt from northern to uh, southern part of Egypt, east to west, and the number of comprehensive stroke center is growing. The same thing in UAE, there are more than 12 centers now, Kuwait, Bahrain, and other countries. The beauty about it that, and this story need to be written one day, that it's a wave. So when you start it in a city, the other city will start to be jealous and they will push the people to go and there. When a story happened about survival of a stroke and how patients recovered, that wave is going to other cities. And that was a lesson that I believe other countries like Africa, Asia can replicate this. So let us to go for any, any comment, Andrew, you would like to give there. Uh, I think it's amazing. Uh, it's so true, so all that, that, that uh, you know, if you do it, your neighbor will do it right? Uh, the one thing is you do need to be strategic. You don't want to have 20 stroke centers in a 1 million radius, right? Then it, yeah. you do have to think about that a little bit, but you're right. That sort of enthusiasm of thrombectomy and thrombolysis, I, I, it's it's really infectious and it does perpetuate things uh, uh, all over. Okay. And, and one of the things that uh, we believe that we will need your advice and other senior people in this field is the number of stroke units is growing. The junior resident from internal medicine, neurology, emergency, and neurosurgery, they're looking to be trained and be a stroke specialist. The number, for example, in uh, and, and Dr. Maria and Hani Arf published a paper in 2018 in the Journal of Stroke, looking for the 
uh, chains over eight years in Middle East, how the number of not just the thrombolysis case, uh, cases or, uh, or thrombectomy, the number of stroke center and the specialist, stroke specialist went from 25 in the region in 2013 to more than 120 in less than five years across the same country. So we are looking for more program of building, teaching, resident who's willing to be practice. And I believe Calgary can help us and support this by uh, by different way. And I believe you are coming soon to the Middle East and we need to meet and speak about this journey. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, I mean, we've trained a hundred fellows from around the world in Calgary and we're open to training more, but clearly we can't do it all. We need lots of you know, centers of excellence, I think, as a Manasso, you should think about, you know, trying to establish five or 10 fellowship centers, uh, programs that can train that have, you know, usually you need a few uh, preceptors and mentors at a site. So you need a facility where there's, you know, at least a few to train, but developing some centers of excellence and fellowship would happy to work with any of you to, to help establish that. Well, that's one of the reasons why do we develop certification in Canada through the CSC, we now have, you know, we, you, I think it's very important to also certify these fellows, right? Establish these programs, certify these fellows. Uh, it's amazing what having fully trained spoke specialists can do to a country. It's amazing the, you know, the multiplier effect that they can train others. So yes, let's do it. It'd be fine. Yeah, great. So let, uh, Firas, let us to go to the question. So first questions to Dr. Firas. It's a challenge question always coming to Sahel, and one of our audience asked that. If a patient came, he was, he's on aspirin for a TIA and came with a minor stroke, what shall we do? You said don't change it. There's no evidence of changing it to Plavex. How can I convince my patients, my uh, family doctor, that I shouldn't change it? No, the, uh, first of all, thank you. The uh, Professor Hill. So the uh, evidence support not to change, but if, he, if he's ha having minor stroke, you should give dual antiplatelet. For the evidence support, giving dual antiplatelet for 21 days. If the then, come with, then, then put him back on aspirin? Yeah, do, the, your patient have TIA, previous history of TIA, and now is coming on with uh, a minor stroke. So the yes. guidelines support giving dual antiplatelet and at the same time, you evaluate the cause of this uh, this stroke because you know is it TIA or not. Mm -hmm. This is very important. The previous history is it real TIA or not? Because you know, uh, even between the expert expert strokeologist, TIA patients, some of the strokeologists, if you just bring one hundred patients with a history of TIA, and you ask one hundred neurologists about uh, the TIA, some of the neurologists will disagree between them and there will be some maybe some argument about this this is a TIA or not TIA so we should be should sure that this is the this is a TIA what was the underlying mechanism the proposed underlying mechanism behind this TIA I think this is the best thing to do uh, nice nice Dr. Andrew uh, uh, as a large city in Middle East now they start to have the comprehensive centers of stroke plus the primary uh, stroke center, and we are starting the uh, 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 collaboration as Minaso with the AHA for certifying these centers. Now we have four has been certified and 12 in the pipeline before the end of the year. The question is, how can we build this system of primary and secondary and transferring patients between these different centers? So comprehensive is far away, from the patient, but there's a one or two primary, but the EMS will take patients to the comprehensive. How can we build this network between these hospitals? Yeah, think of it as three zones, Sahal. So if you're close to comprehensive, you should bypass there, right? You shouldn't go to a primary nearby, especially if it's only 30 minutes more distance. That's the AHA guideline. So bypass if the comprehensive is close. That's the metro zone. The other zone is close to primary, but far from comprehensive. I think that's what you're describing now. Those yes. patients generally should be first assessed at the primary and uh, undergo vascular imaging quickly to detect LVL because you're far away from comprehensive. 
And so those patients can be quickly assessed, but they have to have a door in, door out time less than 60 minutes. So they can't sit there. Right now, they're sitting in that hospital way too long. It's a huge problem, even in Canada. Okay. The third zone is far from comprehensive, far from primary. Some of the rural areas of Saudi Arabia, some other, some other countries may have those challenges. That's where we do the field consultation, where we're called by the by the EMS provider at scene, and we decide where to transport the patient. I'm actually phoned once a week about for these yeah. patients, and I transport them. So those are the three zones of transport that we have to follow, close to comprehensive, close to primary, far from comprehensive, and then far from both, the rural zone. Uh, and these are honey out of a country like Egypt, where there is a few comprehensive center. I think this model will, what do you think, honey? Uh, actually, uh, yes, honey, we can hear you. The comprehensive in at least in one, in each govern rate and university hospital to have a comprehensive stroke center. And now, as I probably I said in Abu Dhabi uh, regarding the uh, GIS, we are working with the uh, ge geography and uh, information system, in which we can put these maps. We are working with our colleagues in the IT. Uh, to have these data, uh, to have the traffic, the distance, the population, and probably the incidence of stroke in different layers, and then upon which the uh, upon these data we can select the areas in which we can put a primary stroke center, a comprehensive stroke center, or a stroke ready hospitals. So probably uh, building uh, based on this data is very very important, and we are working now together. This is a project actually we started already with our colleagues in the um, uh, IT uh, college. And uh, probably it's very important that we s properly select where to position each uh, unit uh, in the country on the map. Great. Now, one thing to add to that, Sahal, has been the TNK story, right? With Tenecteplace, the, the recent ACT trial we published in Lancet. Tenecteplace makes transport easier from a primary stroke center. You don't need an ACLS crew anymore. You can use a BLS crew. You give the injection. So they shouldn't sit at a primary stroke center as long now in the TNK era. So we all need to work toward transitioning in the next year or so. Uh, and that'll make it a little bit easier to get patients over to a comprehensive. You, you're opening a, a new question here about the the the, 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 the standard of the TN, TNK versus the TPA in the guidelines. It's still the guidelines, European, American, Canadian, is keeping TPA up if the patient is not for thrombectomy. So are we going to see changes with this soon or still two years from today? So, so all the bridging trial data, we didn't talk about it today, but all the bridging trial data has only been done at comprehensive stroke centers. So a, primer, a patient that's first seen in a primary should always get thrombolysis. There's no data to suggest otherwise. But I think we're going to shift to TNK. We have two more trials coming next year. The ACT trial was quite convincing, but people may want to see more data. That's fair. But I think the transition is happening. And so for, for I would always give a, alt, uh, give a thrombolytic at a primary and then transport. The debate at comprehensives, as you know, there's a small benefit of TPA plus EBT. Uh, it's small, but it's real. And most people are still doing it. Obviously, cost is a consideration for some countries, right? Doing both therapies, and they have to consider all that. I agree. I agree. Firas, uh, questions from Noor Khan Sidwo, uh, one of our, uh, uh, I, I believe it's pyramids. It's concerned about the interaction of aspirin and uh, uh, protein pump inhibitor. Uh, for gastritis, uh, is there any evidence that aspirin is not working in this group of patients? I would just add for tenective place because we have experience uh, during COVID era uh, when uh, all the hospitals closed regarding stroke service. And uh, we give tenective place for around 16 patients in our, uh, in King Hamad University Hospital where I was working. Uh, and actually we follow that, uh, the, the, it's, it's very beneficial for Safety of the staff because you know the the attach the attachment with the patient will be shorter, and also we give tenective place and refer the patient to the referring hospital like that because we are we are the only we are we was the only hospital that giving uh, TNK at that time. Returning back to the question regarding aspirin and 
this one, uh, the, the, the issue is with the acidity. I mean, when you give uh, the aspirin to be uh, absorbed well in the stomach, it's need acidity, pH between two to four. So if you are giving proton pump inhibitor, you will decrease the acidity and the absorption of aspirin will be less. It will not affect, it will be less, okay? So it's better to use the H2 blockers, the, uh, like uh, we, we know it here as simetidine, uh, ranitidine uh, with aspirin. But it's not contraindicated by the way, but it will decrease the bioavailability of aspirin according to literature. Okay, interest. Um, uh, Andrew, the, the, a question from Mohammed uh, Azhar Khan. Uh, I believe he's a cardiologist, and that's open another questions for Suhail also to 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 ask uh, Andrew here. Other other than neurologists and radiologists, is there any room for to include the intervention cardiologists to line in certifying the stroke uh, intervention uh, courses? So can we use the intervention cardiologist for our acute stroke and thrombectomy? So the solutions are always local to these problems, Sahal, right? It, it really is dependent a little on the country and the capabilities and the personnel. The current society stand on this is one year of dedicated neurointerventional training and a minimum of 15 thrombectomy cases on average a year to maintain competency. That's the that's the standard. Uh, who actually gets that one year of specialized training, I think, is is open to, to uh, really a country decision on how to address this. We have countries with very little of these personnel. Like, it's it's just tragic, actually. All the, such a beautiful therapy, reversing stroke on the table, and many countries have no personnel. So the solution may be unique, but I do recommend one year of dedicated training. There's a lot of nuances to doing the neuro side of this procedure, and it's not something that can be certainly learned in a very short period of time. So that I think that's reasonable to get dedicated training, but what specialties, I'll leave that up to the countries to decide. So, so l l let me to, to say it again. Uh, in Dubai, I have a hospital that Suhail is working at. We don't have any neuro intervention. It's not my main hospital, but, uh, they have uh, four uh, uh, cardiologists who's a cardiac inter uh, interventionist, and they're willing to be trained. They said, Suhail, we have the technique, we can reach the aorta, why we can't go up by uh, 15, uh, 20 centimeter and to get that clot out from the ICA distal or M1. So is there a program that we can work on? I, I spoke with Medtronic for almost a year, and we have been proposing something that a certification which come which can come outside Canada and US as a strokeologist intervention who's just doing a stroke business and they're not a neurologist or a stroke who's they're just an interventionist sitting there and they are a cardiologist they are body interventionists who can do these type of uh, thrombectomy and as you know that now with the new pump suction or the penumbra suction and other devices, it's only a couple of minutes and the clot is out. Is there any 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 program that uh, Professor Demchok is thinking about uh, that is Canada or we can do it with Minaso at the level of the Middle East and we have a good center, the Rashid Hospital where I'm working, we are doing almost 100 plus per a year of thrombectomy. City Hospital, they are doing around 35. That's only in a city of Dubai. Uh, Hani Araf in Egypt, in your center, how many you are doing per year? Uh, approaching 100 also. Okay. And in Riyadh, with uh, Fahad and the others, they are doing a couple of hundreds. So at least we will be able to do something for Africa, Middle East, and Pakistan, Iran. So, so is there anything we can do with this? Yeah, so I'm not aware of any sort of short training kind of opportunity that's sort of compelling enough that I could sanction it at this time. Here's what I would say. Each center's solution is, is a local one. I, I personally think that this technique requires at least one in one neuro interventionist on the team. I, I'm strongly advocating in Canada, for example, that every comprehensive stroke center in Canada have at least one neuro expert as part of the larger team, because you get into these very tricky cases, Sahal, where you get in all sorts of adventure, right? Really complex cases. 
Agreed. And having that team member uh, available is crucial for that. So, you know, if maybe the solution is a hybrid one, but I would really encourage sites to to invest in at least one neuro-trained person as part of the team, and then you can go from there. Um, it's obviously controversial. There's, there's, you know, different specialties involved. But again, fundamentally, it comes down to proper one year of proper neuro training minimum. Very clear. Very clear. Dr. Firas, questions from Dr. Mohammed Khaled. About recurrent stroke in a patient with malignancy for a prevention, do you use NOAC in these patients? Uh, actually, Dr. Sell, uh, yes. Uh, there is uh, uh, most of the data extrapolated from the uh, the thromboembolic event rather than stroke, okay? So the guidelines build most of the guidelines regarding dealing uh, in stroke patients, uh, stroke in, uh, in, sorry, stroke in cancer patients, extrapolated from other thrombo, uh, thromboembolic events rather than stroke. And the guidelines recommend DOAX. There is, there is a recommendation for DOAX, but there is a study studying the embolus in thrombectomy. They did a thrombectomy for a patient with cancer and presented with large vessel occlusion. And they found that most of the thrombus are rich with uh, platelets aggregation. Maybe aspirin will have a role. Clear studies, clear randomized studies, not there, but most of the studies most of the guidelines are uh, taken from the other thromboembolic events. Just to mention here, Dr. Sale, just lastly, there was a published uh, study, uh, published in neurology, I think, by uh, Dr. Al-Mufti. Uh, he's a neurovascular uh, neurologist in the uh, United States, New York. Uh, and he led the, uh, a group of uh, analysis of the uh, outcome of thrombectomy in, in uh, cancer patients. And the results was uh, promising, actually. It's, uh, uh, the, the, the outcome was good for them. Uh, the most important thing that we check those patients regarding uh, their functional outcome, their outcome, their expected life, ex uh, the expected life, and their functional status before we start uh, our intervention. And so they are all talking. Interest. Uh, just to continue, Dr. Hani, with the questions, uh, time is running, and there's many uh, many of the audience, they're just sending this a behavior in the Middle East saying, thank you, Dr. Demchok, thank you, Dr. Vras, and I'm skipping these thanks and uh, a blessing. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, one of our uh, attendees regarding uh, the question saying, as a primary center, should you do IVTPA? and transfer patients directly to comprehensive stroke center where further treatments such as intra-RTR TPA or mechanical thrombectomy can be done. Is it safe to transfer these patients after TPA? Number one. Number two, why, uh, why uh, comprehensive stroke center often uh, delay the acceptance uh, these patient and asking for different questions about the condition of the patient and other uh, uh, medical reports. So, Doctor Demchok, is that the practice in uh, Canada? Sorry, just re I'm just trying to answer the Q and A questions quickly for you. Just please repeat real quick. So, a uh, question number. Uh, the question is regarding. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you went through that question, but that uh, question was regarding the IVTPA. Uh, is all patients who receive IVTPA in a primary stroke center need to be transferred to comprehensive stroke center, or there is a criteria for these patients? Question number two: Is there uh, 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 should be a comprehensive uh, medical report and insurance approval for patients to be uh, shifted from primary stroke center to comprehensive? Yeah. So for the first question, obviously, if they have a large vessel occlusion, uh, a, a target for thrombectomy, ICA M1 proximal M2 Basler then uh, I would always transport that patient from a primary because the recanalization rates, we've published the intersex study, the early recanalizations rate with IVTPA is 20 to 40%, depending on the location. It's lower for carotids. So you just don't know which of these is gonna open with TPA alone. So you, you should transport those patients. The, the insurance issues and, the, uh, and those things I'll leave to the individual countries. That's obviously dependent on the country. 
But uh, the from a practical perspective, if you have a large artery occlusion, you can't necessarily expect the TPA to do the trick. So we always transport those patients. Uh, now, in some cases, the artery opens beautifully with TPA or, or tenecteplase, and that's a great thing when it happens. But the, that's in a minority of patients. So you do benefit from transporting those patients quickly to a thrombectomy facility. Very clear. Dr. Hani, I promise that I will ask three questions, then I will give you the mic. So uh, Dr. Firas, uh, Dr. Omar Al-Juhani is asking the following question. If the patient is on dual antiplatelet and he developed a new ischemic stroke lacuna, what shall I do? Yeah, I'll actually that's a question, <laughs> okay, to answer. Uh, the, there is a study uh, regarding lacunar stroke. Uh, 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 what the control, as, as we mentioned, check your adherence, check the risk factor control, because lacunar infarctions, uh, hypertension control is uh, mandatory and uh, risk factor control mandatory. So I will check, especially if it is, you are sure lacunar infarction, measuring the size and defining the size of lacunar by MRI or by CT using the one, uh, the 15 millimeter and the 20 millimeter in diffusion weight, 15 in CT and uh, 20. So be sure that this is lacunar. Be sure that your patient is ad adherent to medications. Uh, be sure that there is no drug to drug interaction. Be sure the risk factor are controlled. Uh, this is the most important steps to follow in all stroke patients, not only lacunar. Okay. Uh, Dr. Demchok, uh, there's a question about uh, the NIH stroke scale. Uh, where's that question? Uh, did you answer that question because it disappeared? I haven't quite got there. Uh, okay. So uh, there's a question it, uh, about, uh, yeah, uh, uh, from Dr. Ahmed uh, Zakut. Do you still think that NIH stroke scale in acute stroke is more applicable than the RACE score? Yeah, the RACE score is really only designed as a brief assessment for the paramedics. It's been validated in Spain and is used. Uh, it's a, quite a comprehensive scale, so it, there is some training required of paramedics. We use something called LAMS in Alberta because it's simpler, and we have to train 6,000 first first providers, which is very challenging. So we stick to the simplicity. NI stroke scale scores for the hospital, for the arrival and assessment by the stroke team, and it will not be replaced by something simpler. It has too much useful information. We know what an NIH stroke scale score of five means versus 15. It's used in all our clinical trials. It's the standard, and it will remain the hospital-based score for some time. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Firas, the last question, and uh, I uh, I will ask also both of our speakers, there's a list of questions coming if they will have time to answer it uh, later. Uh, Dr. Firas, the last question is about, uh, and it's again from Omar Al-Juhani, which is a challenge case. Uh, uh, he had a patient who's uh, having atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation, and patient had a new lacunar stroke. Shall he add antiplatelet to this patient? Yes, according to the last European Stroke Organization guideline, it's titled pharmacological treatment. So they recommend uh, uh, if there is a coronary artery disease, in addition to stroke, they, uh, they recommend uh, uh, DOAX with aspirin, with a single antiplatelet. But please try to avoid the triple. Triple uh, carry, I mean, triple agents, uh, two antiplatelets with the uh, anticoagulant will carry high risk of uh, hemorrhage. There is a recommendation regarding this. Just please uh, just review the pharmacological intervention of secondary stroke prevention in the European Stroke Organization website uh, 2022. You will find it. Thank you. Dr. Hani, this is one of the best webinar I have been ever this year. So please, your conclusion. Uh, it was a great, uh, and I guess we benefited a lot uh, from both our speakers. Uh, uh, Dr. Demchuk, of course, highlighted the importance of stroke service and uh, improvement. And I guess we, we need your uh, expertise in this area. It's very important uh, because uh, we are in this, you know, uh, in this era of developing uh, more and more and better stroke service in the Middle East. So with your help, I guess uh, we can build more stroke units and we can improve the stroke service. And also Dr. Firas heightened the importance of uh, uh, 
recurrent ischemic strokes, especially in, in special situations which uh, usually we are not facing, like uh, tumors and like the ESUS uh, cases in which it's very difficult sometimes to investigate. And it was a heated discussion, and I can see the list of questions uh, are coming more and more, and uh, I, I hope that the both speakers can have time to answer uh, the questions. And uh, by the end, I will uh, thank, of course, uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Suhail, for his uh, effort in improving the stroke service uh, in the region through the organization, the MINASO, and uh, looking for more and more. Uh, we started a very small uh, group, and now we can see that we have in the cooperation with many of the important organizations across the world. And uh, um, uh, after, you know, of course, that uh, in a couple of years, we will have also the joint meeting with the World Stroke uh, Organization in Abu Dhabi, which is, again, uh, another uh, great step in the development of our organization. Uh, the last word for you, Dr. Suhail. Thank you, uh, Professor Demchok. Thanks for uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Demchok uh, added his email in the chat uh, bar and also he's welcome for all your questions. Thank you.